the name of Allah, the most gracious and most merciful, may the peace and blessings of Allah the exalted be upon the Prophet Muhammad and his purified progeny. And may the damnation of Allah be upon their enemies. Dear brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to our sixth episode where we were discussing the rights of non-Muslims under a legitimate non-terrorist Islamic state and we were also discussing the concept of jizya. Now in the last episode we discussed the rights that they have when they live as the protected non-Muslims under an Islamic state and amongst those rights is that they are able to of course practice their religion. They are not forced, they are not compelled to become Muslims. They are able to stay upon their religious beliefs. Although as Muslims we do not believe these beliefs are correct, they still have the freedom to do that. And we said about the narrations, we showed some of the narrations of the Ahlul Bayt alayhim as-salam, which are mentioned in Al-Kafi, where the Imams says that a sulh, a type of treaty, is made where they are not allowed, the people of the book, to display open drinking within the streets. However, in their churches and in their houses, they are able to do so. That is their business, basically. Now, one may counter this and say that, oh, so where's my personal freedom? I want to be able to openly promote the drinking and consumption of alcohol. I want to bring others to do that with me, wherever I am. This, this violates my freedom if I would not be able to do this. And remember, we're speaking theoretically. But what we have in Islam is a concept of preventing dangerous ideas which harm the whole of society. Now, everyone will agree with me that there are types of ideas which shouldn't be allowed to be voiced. If someone wants to come, for example, and promote rape, and promote raping women or men or whatever, people will agree that this type of idea shouldn't be under freedom of speech because there's a whole discussion surrounding freedom of, freedom of speech, of course, and what it actually means. But many people would agree that no, this type of idea is wrong and it shouldn't be able to be promoted. Another controversial and contentious topic which is uh, spoken about is paedophilia. So if someone comes out and starts advocating pro-paedophilia slogans or ideas, then should this be something that is acceptable? Of course not, because this damages the society. So we also have this concept within Islam and there are many proofs as to why alcohol is something that should not be openly promoted in the society due to the damage that it causes to the individuals such as death, such as um, liver and kidney problems and of course damage to families and other people's lives who are around these people for example that become alcoholics. Now we go to our next um, point about what rights these people enjoy within an Islamic state, a legitimate Islamic state. Now the next point we come to is about the benefits of those who are under a legitimate Islamic state, the non-Muslims, what they have. One of these well-known rights that they have is that they, they are not compelled to join the Muslim army. So when there is a war going on, they are not compelled to do so and be part of the Muslim army and engage in a war. And this could prevent them from fighting against people who are out of their own religion. So they are not forced to do that. Another right that they have is what? The protection of their wealth, the protection of their honor, and their lives are fully protected the same as the Muslims. So they make their contribution, the Muslims have their own contribution of taxes, and due to this, these non-Muslims, the Ahlul Dhimma, that live under the legitimate Islamic State, they of course have the protection. So if they are harmed, this is the responsibility upon the Muslims to protect them and treat them justly, just as Muslims would be treated justly. And the fourth Imam, Imam Zainul Abidin, Imam Sajjad, alayhi salam, he has a whole chapter or a whole um, passage addressing the Ahlul Dhimma or addressing actually the Muslims with their duty towards the protected people. Now I won't read the full paragraph, one can go to Risalatul Huquq, the Treaties of Rights by the fourth infallible Imam alayhi salam 
and read the full passage. And of course, this is available in English and Arabic and Persian and maybe Urdu other languages. But a part of the passage that I'll read, we will analyze inshallah ta'ala and focus on one particular saying of this. So the title of this is Haqqu Ahl Dhimma. So the right of the people, the protected people, the, the dhimmis, the Ahl Dhimma. Imam Sajjad said, and you should judge among them with the judgments of God that he commanded for you regarding the conditions of dealing with them and do not wrong them, so do not wrong these protected non-Muslims as long as they honour God's covenant and fulfil their pledge and the pledge of the Prophet, may God's peace be upon him and his household, is a barrier since it is reported that the Prophet Muhammad he said من ظلم معاهدا كنت خصم خصمة. So whoever uh, oppresses a mu'ahid, so someone who has a treaty, then I will be his enemy. And there's a variation of this hadith, although I did not find it in the books of the Shia, and some of our scholars have commented saying it is actually in the books of the Mukhalifin and not the Shia, where he says that من ظلم ذمي كنت خصم خصمه and then he says on يوم القيامة so the Prophet Muhammad as quoted by the fourth Imam says that whoever oppresses one with a treaty then the Prophet Muhammad is against him it doesn't matter whether he is Muslim or non-Muslim that is irrelevant if he is one with a treaty and this can be in many different aspects because the Prophet Muhammad said مُعَاهِدًا so if you violate this person who has a treaty with you, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, the Prophet Muhammad will be against you. And this shows the importance within the religion of Islam that when one makes a covenant with someone and an agreement, he should not oppress them. So these Ahlul Dhimma, these protected people who would be living in an Islamic state, they have the same rights to be treated in a just and fair way. And if any one of the Muslims would oppress them, he doesn't just get a priority because he's a Muslim and this is fine. No, the Prophet Muhammad as quoted by the fourth Imam, would be against this person. Again, مَنْ ظَلَمَ مُعَاهِدًا كُنْتُ خَسْمَ So whoever oppresses a Mu'ahid, the one who has the covenant, then I will be his enemy. So the one who has a treaty, the one who has a covenant with someone that with the Muslims and they oppress him, this is against the teachings of Islam and the Prophet Muhammad So Imam Sajjad السلام, he continues and he says therefore fear God and there is no power but in God. Now was this just something that the Imams السلام, said where they said that do not oppress non-Muslims, these protected people give them their rights is it just something that was spoken about or is it something that they demonstrated within their behavior that if these non-Muslims would be oppressed, then the Imams السلام, would show sadness for this. Because we find that some of these Nawasib and these people such as Anjum Chowdhury, a well-known infamous terrorist who was sent to prison and may he never come out of prison, he said once that, okay, it's not allowed at all to feel sorry for non-Muslims. He said something around these words, I'm paraphrasing. And some people have this attitude. So is this the case that I as a Muslim, I cannot feel sorry for non-Muslims who are oppressed? I want to bring the example of Imam Ali alayhi salam. It was reported to him that an incident occurred where a commander of Muawiyah, may Allah's damnation be upon him, a commander of Muawiyah's army, what did they do? They attacked a city or a village and they entered people's houses. They entered people, people's houses by force, despite there being women inside. And Imam Ali alayhi salam describes that this was also Muslim women and non-Muslim women. Let's see what he says. So out of grief and sorrow, Imam Ali alayhi salam, he says, 
I have come to know that every one of them entered upon Muslim women and other women under the protection of Islam and took away their ornaments from legs, from their legs, arms, necks and ears. So Imam Ali alayhi salam is saying that this commander of Muawiyah and his army, they forcefully entered these houses and they took the jewellery off the women in a barbaric way. And obviously Muawiyah, he followed the sunnah of Omar to threaten people and go into their houses. This is Muawiyah's commanders and his army. So Imam Ali alayhi salam, he continues after that and he says that if any Muslim dies of grief after all this, he is not to be blamed. And this is found in Najul Balagha in the sermon 27. So Imam Ali alayhi salam, he was upset for these women who were under the protection of Islam. Both these women who were Muslim women and non-Muslim women, their honor was violated by these savages in the army of Muawiyah under this commander. Imam Ali alayhi salam, he didn't just say, I feel sorry for the Muslim women and ignore the oppression that occurred upon the non-Muslim women. No, he says again that if any Muslim dies of grief after all of this, then he is not to be blamed. So this is, of course, the justice of Ahlul Bayt alayhim as -salam. And it shows us that they did not merely preach and quote the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu speaking about the rights pertaining to the protected people within a legitimate Islamic state. No, rather when incidents occurred and oppression occurred against these types of people, the protected people, non-Muslims, then the Imam was upset about this. So we find from this seerah of the Imams that these protected people, although they are non-Muslims, one can feel sorry for them because oppression, whether the oppression occurs on non-Muslims or Muslims, is still oppression. And a Muslim and someone who aspires to be a Shi'i of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, should always condemn and feel sorry when oppression occurs. And this is not just oppression against the Muslims. So this is one example that we derive, dear brothers and sisters. And we are coming short of time now. So in the next episode, we will continue speaking about the benefits of the people who live in a legitimate Islamic state. We recap again and we say that one of the benefits that they have is that they are fully protected. And if they are violated, if their honor is violated, then the Muslims have a responsibility upon themselves to condemn this oppression, just like Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam did. In the next episode, we will shed light upon the next benefit that the protected people have which is, of course, a system that gives financial assistance to them. And we will quote the famous story of when Imam Ali alayhi salam was walking in the streets of Kufa and he came across an old kitabi man who was begging on the street. So he was a Christian man. And we will mention the story about this and Imam Ali alayhi salam, his reaction towards this incident which is in recorded within our books. So please join us inshallah ta'ala for the next episode where we will elaborate upon this point. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ajjil farajahum wa ala adahum.